Hey, it's very... Hello, so welcome everyone. We have an excellent group of climate tech investors for you today. So welcome David, Sophia, Seth. And the topic we have today in front of us is perhaps the biggest one in the world. It is investing in solutions to the climate crisis. This is an area that has been described as a total addressable market of the entire world. So what we're talking about is how do we decarbonize the entire global economy from transportation to food and materials production, the built environment, energy, many things besides that. So I figured we could kick things off by really touching base on how we all define climate tech investing. Some firms define their mandate differently than other firms. So the question to all of you is for your firms, what's in, what's out, and what's your, what's your reasoning behind that? Seth, do you want to kick us off? <laughs> sure, yeah. So I think uh, roughly climate tech can be broken down into three broad categories. One is decarbonization, taking uh, emittive methods of production or methods of anything and making them less emittive. Two is, is uh, capture, so taking the uh, greenhouse gas emissions that are already in the atmosphere and getting them out. And then three is uh, adaptation. So the acknowledgement that this problem is going to be really bad and we want to make it a little bit less bad um, by, for instance, making it easier to build new housing quickly so that the people that are going to be forced to migrate can, can have a place to live. And so at 50 years, we, we focus entirely on the, on the first two. I think the, the third one is really, really important, um, but it's a, it's a little bit, I don't know, too dark for us. We, we, I think we want to be optimists and we want to uh, try and figure out a way of, of making this crisis um, less bad and less destructive and to eliminate the need for the adaptation. And so we're looking for companies that are significantly decarbonizing uh, industry, uh, and then also companies that are figuring out clever ways of taking greenhouse gas emissions out of, out of the air. Super. So our view um, is highly inspired by Project Drawdown that sort of describe the current sources. So energy, buildings, um, uh, transportation, uh, food and ag. Um, and, uh, and the current sinks, which is land sinks and coastal and ocean sinks. And, and that's pretty much like a really broad view of what climate investment is, but that's the one we're taking. With an underlying belief that, as you touch on, like every, pretty much everything has to be updated, renewed, in a way that is aligned with the aspiration of our societies, being healthy, being safe and uh, taking into account the constraint of our environment, which is what we all know. So, and when you think this way, pretty much everything can be, can be done. So our take um, is to look at carbon going in and out of the system, of course. It's to look at the adaptation, which we think is important and, well, yeah, un unavoidable at this point. But also the sort of set of interlinking problems, like, you know, acidification of the oceans, uh, you know, water, like uh, managing water resources, um, you know, things like uh, deforestation, uh, destruction of uh, biodiversity, and a few other systems that are like under unbelievable pressure and all required to kind of have a livable planet. Uh, so we look at it slightly broader uh, than, than just climate. Mm -hmm. Great. And uh, just to round things out at Voyager, uh, we focus on preventing planet warming gases from entering the atmosphere, so mitigation. And we also invest in carbon removal, so taking CO2 that has already been emitted and removing it from the atmosphere. And across our firm, we've set ourselves a target of 500 million tons CO2 equivalent emissions, which allows us some flexibility to also look at things like methane, very potent greenhouse gas. Uh, and that's in aggregate across our entire portfolio over the lifetime of the fund. So again, some flexibility, recognizing yeah. that some companies will directly be removing carbon or preventing it from being emitted, and some will be supporting those activities in meaningful ways. Um, I'll, I'll just allow myself okay. to add that the, you know, we were looking for frameworks that would sort of allow us to th reason about this. Mm -hmm. And the framework we came to, which we really like and are highly promoting to everyone, <laughs> is the Planetary Boundaries Framework mm -hmm. by the Stockholm Resilience Center. Um, you know, which, which gives us a very sort of nicely balanced view and, and uh, you know, very scientific basis for some of our intuitive decision making. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So um, one thing that I find frustrating, I know some of you may find frustrating, is the description of sustainability 
or sort of climate solutions as inherently less good than the existing paradigm we have today. And uh, I personally don't think that's true. Uh, we look for products that are better than the fossil fuel products they're replacing. But I think the, the community as a whole maybe hasn't done the best job of selling that vision of like what is the daily quality of life improvement we get from switching away from fossil fuels. So I wanted to ask all of you, what is a, like a specific example where you know, regular people would see an improvement in their daily life by replacing fossil fuel-based products with something cleaner? Yeah, so I think historically people have thought of sustainable products as something you, you sort of sacrifice quality or convenience for, or pay more for, because it's good for the environment. And, and I think there's always going to be a niche of consumers that are willing <laughs> to do that, and that's great. I'm one of them. But like, that is not going to get us uh, through this crisis. So we actually have something at 50 Years we call the Mr. Burns test. So Mr. Burns is this uh, a character from The Simpsons. He's basically a prototypic, uh, greedy industrial capitalist. Um, all he cares about is you know, his, his bottom line and nothing else. And so we want to back uh, founders that are building products that at some point Mr. Burns would buy, right? This is someone who doesn't care at all about the planet or other people. He just buys what's best for him because it's tastier, more convenient, cheaper, better. Um, and so this is the sort of new crop of companies. It's really exciting. I've got, I've got one right here. It's called Planet A. It's, uh, it's, it's chocolate without cocoa, and it's just delicious, right? It's and super I, tasty. I, it's super tasty, and like, I want to eat it just because I like it. And, and like, the sustainability part comes as a sort of added bonus. A company that we seeded um, uh, just announced today, or the FDA announced today, that they're going to be able to sell in the United States. It's called Upside Foods. They grow real meat without animals. And I've tasted their uh, meat. They make a duck a la orange, they make southern fried chicken, they make meatballs, and it is just delicious, delicious meat. And at some point, they have a path to having the cheapest, healthiest, tastiest, most convenient meat. And that is going to be really exciting for everybody because you're going to be able to have all the meat you want cheaper than you pay for it now. It's going to be healthier than anything you eat now. And you're going to feel really good because there's going to be no climate impact or cruelty to animals. And so th those are the products that we get really excited about. Uh, I would mention, I'm a big fan as well as Alternative Protein and, and sort of made um, my first investment on sort of that pieces in 2016, but it's an insect, so it's really less, <laughs> maybe appealing to the mass. Uh, but um, uh, now the one I'm really, really excited about is mobility and electrification and um, e-bikes in particular. So like if you live in a city, the noise, the pollutions, and most of the journey are short, and most people today have to take the train or the bus or because the, it's too long to be able to walk. And um, we, um, and that's to your point, like, it's a very easy example. And we, um, after a long search, we ended up investing in a company called Cowboy. Uh, and it's a, just a fantastic, beautiful uh, designed bike. It's a bit like the sort of iPhone of bikes in our view. Um, and, and, and to your point, they, they scale. They, they make 45 million revenues in a few years, super healthy PNL, profitable in a year or two, 71 NPS, always winning awards in design. I mean, if you love design and bikes, you, you, you buy that, you know? So, so I think that's in a consumer space, I, I would definitely go for e-bikes as my favorite. One way I look at it is that you know, we have this industrial system that came out of the Industrial Revolution several, a few hundred years ago, and it's so wasteful, and it's so fucking dirty, and it's smelly, and it's like also you know, destroying the whole planet. And, and you know, this crisis, which we have, is a very bad crisis. We can get back to how bad it is in a second. Um, you know, shouldn't be wasted, right? So we had the opportunity to fucking rebuild all this shit and like, make nice, clean, quiet, beautiful things. And you know, we, 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 as, as investors in the space, we see all these solutions, and they're really coming, and it's amazing. You know, and you know, the people want them, governments want them, businesses are buying them. You know, we as a community, we just have to build all these kind of amazing things, and you know, get them up there so they can be ready for mass consumption. Yeah, it's about fucking time. Completely agree. Um, I think it's it's sometimes you know it's ridiculous how people talk about an attachment to fossil fuels because when you think about what interaction a, a person has in their daily life with a fossil fuel. It's some toxic sludge <laughs> that we like dug out from underground <laughs> that you put in your home or your car and you burn and then you breathe in the fumes and it you know, makes the air every, quality every, every, Everyone likes the smell of gasoline <laughs> a little bit, right? Though. <laughs> <laughs> so I live in New York City and one of the things I love to do is walk around New York City and picture what it's going to look like when we yes. get rid of all the combustion engines and, and stop burning all the fossil fuels and the air can be as clean as it is 
out in the countryside. I mean, that's, that's a change I would love to have in my city. If you, if you say, pull into your garage, close the garage door behind you, when your car is running and you fall asleep, there's a good chance you die <laughs> with a combustion yeah. engine car, right? You know, if you do that with a Tesla, well, it'll, actually, it'll just shut off because we'll realize it's, it's there, right? And so, like, a lot of these products will just be qualitatively better experiences for consumers. And then, oh, by the way, you know, they're sustainable. Good point about combustion engines. It's a very serious side effect that you noted. And I wonder if those products would get approved today mm, in a world mm. where we have electric vehicles. Yep. Yeah. Which, one, which one are you the most excited about? What sort of... You know, I, I rode an e-bike for the first time, which is a little embarrassing given what I, what I do for work, but it was, it was really fun. It was like joyous. It wasn't just more convenient, it was actually fun. So maybe I'll, ha I'll have to get an e-bike. A um, cowboy. <laughs> so let's, let's talk about scaling. Uh, this is something where the challenges of bringing a climate tech company to massive global scale sometimes look different than scaling a software company. Uh, they may be nonlinear challenges. Uh, so I'd love to hear your perspective on what are some of the challenges that disproportionately are important for companies building in climate tech and potential solutions for addressing some of those scaling challenges. So one has to be very careful, of course. Um, you know, as investors, you know, we, we need to generate returns because otherwise we're not in business. Um, so you know, we have to look for things and be smart about finding things that can scale. And then, you know, there are things that are a little harder to do than in software, um, but can be solved with, you know, all, all kinds of non-diluted financing. Um, so, so it is possible to find these kind of high IP, highly scalable businesses. Eventually, may, they may consume a lot of capital, but that will be, you know, when they build out massive, you know, infrastructure, and that, that we don't have to pay for that, and our investors don't have to pay for that. I also, there's, there's two challenges that a lot of, especially deep tech climate companies face that um, software companies don't. Um, and, it, and, and, and both of these challenges are, in our estimation, a huge part of why sort of the clean tech 1.0 boom and bust happened. So one, with a lot of deep tech companies, um, you have to do like a really solid techno-economic analysis before you start going. Techno-economic analysis is basically like an Excel spreadsheet where you list out all of the assumptions around your costs, right? Everything from the steel and your bioreactors if you're going to make them, to the energy that you're going to need to power them, to the land that you're going to need to rent, to the labor, all the, to your agents, all those things. And then you make some assumptions around how good your process is going to be, and then you sort of make some assumptions around what you're going to be able to sell your stuff for, and you're basically saying, does, that, does the math make sense, right? Um, and in Cleantech 1.0, a lot of companies didn't do that, and they built these big, beautiful things, and then they just weren't economical. Um, and in, in pure software, you don't have to do that because software is so cheap, it's like zero marginal cost that you can basically start to build and kind of assume that it's going to work its way, uh, work, work itself out. And so that's, that's a challenge that a lot of deep tech climate companies have. The other, uh, which is also a mistake that was made in Cleantech 1.0, is that you're typically building some, some physical thing, some asset, which then has a production capacity. Um, and you really don't want to wait until that asset is fully online to start building your distribution and sales. Um, but it's kind of hard to do that because, like, how do you sell something that you're not making yet? Um, and so in Cleantech 1.0, companies waited until it was online, then they started to sell. But it turns out that even if you're selling a commodity product cheaper than everyone else, it takes a long time to, like, ramp up sales. And so it would take, you know, two years to build a thing and then two years to have the sales reach capacity. Now your payback period is really pushed out. And so what we've seen a lot of uh, companies do, Solution in our, in, our, in our portfolio has done this really well, is they've literally built their distribution by taking the product that they will sell when their production capacity is online, just literally buying it on the open market, <laughs> selling it, and then as soon as the asset comes online, they stop buying it and swap it out for, for, their, for, the, for, their, for their own product. And, and the, by doing that, you can have 100% of your capacity spoken for literally the week that your asset comes online. And so th these are a couple of the sort of challenges that a lot of especially deep tech climate companies have to think about that you know, software companies uh, really don't. Mm. I can build up on that. I think... Um, from my perspective, it's a lot about the asymmetry of understanding between the investment community and the entrepreneurs. What they're doing is so much more complex. It's most of the solutions are full stack, so it's, which is great for an investor because you capture all the value most of the time, but it is more complex. So you need to understand the retail component, the technology component. The, the, so, and and uh, historically, as venture capitalists, we've not done that much. So I think first is really educating, uh, which, it, which is a big part of, and having like we do with our 
firms having like a lot of expertise and knowledge through partnership or within our venture partner network, but you do need that expertise to be good at doing it. So I think that that's structural. And, and then one which is um, unfortunate but still very true is that uh, people want to back what is proven. So it's like, I remember when, when so many times I had that conversation, like, yeah, but show me 10 companies who existed at more than 2 billion or 1 billion or whatever. And like, but I can't because I'm just telling you about a future market and a future opportunity. So, so, and, and just as the way people think, you know, and, and so, the, and that's why around this table, we, we share actually a lot of strong conviction about ad performance. We're all obsessed about ad performance. So until you have that, it's complicated to convince more, more people. But I want to end on a positive note, though, is that uh, I was looking at some numbers there earlier today for, for, for this panel and, and, and I was really optimistic about it. Like, if you look at the last eight years, the amount um, invested in climate is 155x, which is compared to AI, just so we have like an idea, which was 47x. So it's actually massive. And, um, and we don't talk about this enough, but it's happening. It really is happening. But it's happening more in later stage, very mature assets, and less so in venture. But it's coming. We're the first generation, but, but hopefully you know, many, many more will follow. And that's, of course, a function of like, civilization having woken up to this, <laughs> and the, the buyers, like the, the end you know, in, in infrastructure builders actually being ready. So you know, this community has tool makers. We have to kind of give them stuff to build. Yeah, and, and I think it's true because one of um, our entrepreneurs phrased that perfectly in my view is that when it's not your problem, you don't care. So the fact that it's become universal, whether you are in India, China, France, or the US, now it's your problem. So because it's your problem, you're interested in it. And, and that really interconnection of those problems is actually very powerful. It's, it's unfortunate, but it is actually driving a lot of the capital towards what we do. It's actually really interesting. Most products that do good, do good for the like, consumer that has access to it or interacts with it. But with climate tech, you know, a ton of greenhouse gas emissions removed anywhere helps everyone everywhere. Sure. Right? It is just like inherently a global yeah. good. Mm -hmm. And so that's something we really haven't seen with many mm -hmm. past technological that's so ways. True. That is very true. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. let's talk about European versus North American climate tech investing. Um, a fellow investor said to me uh, earlier today that in Europe, we make rules to solve a problem. In the US, we throw money at it. Uh, whether or not that's true, and question to you all whether you agree, uh, in the US we have started throwing money at the problem, finally, which is great. Uh, we just passed a massive uh, climate yeah. bill. It's not called the climate bill for political reasons. <laughs> it's very poorly named. It is the best climate bill with the worst name. It's called the Inflation <laughs> Reduction Act, or the IRA, not the Irish Republic. Which is Army. exactly what it's not going to do, <laughs> sadly. Um, and it is, it is a massive amount of investment. It is four times bigger than the last big investment yeah. bill we passed, which was after the 2008-2009 uh, financial crisis. It's over $300 billion in funding across a spectrum of solutions that includes a roughly $30 billion green bank for preferential financing for climate tech solutions, money for um, electric vehicle infrastructure, a uh, expanded 45Q tax credit, uh, which is a tax credit for carbon capture and carbon sequestration, among many other things. So it's super exciting. Uh, it's certainly starting to change the landscape in the US. Uh, so question to all of my fellow panelists is, what are you excited about in European investing, and how do you see the difference between investing in climate tech in those two markets? So I'm the only Europe-focused fund, so <laughs> I'll start. So, um, so in Europe, it's, it really is the most advanced in terms of like affinity and familiarity with the with the challenge. You know, it's 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 just a continent that always been very concerned around sustainability and social. Um, um, fairness and all it, that's just all roots and also because of the history of like colonization and everything there is actually a mixity in the population that is said that we also understand what's going on in emerging countries so uh, and you can see this in the numbers like like um, if you look at the emissions in the last uh, sort of decades uh, China of course is just like to the roof 
um, US was neutral, and Europe was already minus 25%. So we are in advance in terms of our emissions and our policies, but we don't have enough capital. And that's always the challenge, you know. So in the US, it's the opposite. You know, it's like you go from zero to one overnight, and then there's a massive funds allocated. But what that means for companies is just something to know, you know. And 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 that's true that the later stage, you are, I would say, Series B plus, your mortality event becomes quite rough, and you have to you have to do two things. One is being a bit more technical about understanding different type of deal structures. There's not there is standard preferred equity. We all know that there is um, less standard terms, you know, structured debt, structured equity, and it sounds Chinese, but it's so important that you understand the the the, the varieties that you can have access to. And the second is obviously uh, travel the US notably, but also to other part of the world where where they have a strategic short term interest through the regulations, for example. And we've seen that with some of our companies and it's been very successful. I, I also invest in Europe, actually. So 70% Europe and a little bit, little bit of, of companies coming to Europe. I mean, we see, you know, we're investing around the eight, 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 Series A, and you know, we just see a lack of capital in that stage. Uh, you know, there's a way more in the US, uh, for sure. There's a lot of quality companies here. And you know, at the A stage, a lot of these companies are not quite ready to cross Yes, the, 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 the pond. Um, so, you know, yeah, there's some very good opportunities here in Europe for that, getting reasonable ish valuations and, uh, you know, feel we can add value. And then we're also investing like 30% in basically US companies or foreign companies that are coming to Europe because a lot of these companies see that, you know, there are things happening here, yes, on the regulation side where we're strong, um, whatever that means. And you know they, they're coming and, and looking for good partners. Right. When we try to be a one, be one, of course. So we're, we're 90 percent focused on North America, and <laughs> with about 10 percent of the founders we're supporting are in Europe. Um, I would say there's a few things to be really excited about, and a few things that need to get fixed. So the things to get excited about, uh, as Sophie mentioned, you know the, there is a, a much greater uh, pull from the market for sustainable solutions. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the societies are less sort of individualistic American and they care about each other more. And if you care about each other more, you tend to care about the climate crisis a little bit more. Also very interesting is that institutional investors, so not VCs, but institutional investors care a lot more about climate in Europe. I, I was talking to someone who works with a lot of them and they said they, they roughly estimate that somewhere between 90, 95% of institutional investors in Europe have some sort of ESG or climate mandate and that that number is five to 10% in the US. Hmm. Um, so that's very exciting. Wow. Europe also has some incredible research universities, right, where, you know, in those labs, there are solutions being built to basically every problem you could think of. Um, so that, that's all very exciting. On the flip side... And you find people who've been working on climate, like, for 20 years. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> like, really going deep. It's amazing. On the flip side, I do think that there's a need for more capital, especially at the uh, sort of, like, later stages. There's a huge funding gap in Europe that doesn't really exist in, in, in the States anymore. Uh, two... There's sort of like a swashbuckling, like, you know, shoot for the moon attitude that yeah. is very popular in Silicon Valley, where I'm, I'm from, that I think more European climate tech founders can embrace. You shouldn't be planning to have a company that you sell in three to four years if you're trying to solve the climate crisis. You know, the Solugen founders started off wanting to decarbonize the chemicals industry, which is one of the most emitted industries on Earth. And now, five years in, they've changed it to wanting to decarbonize industry, right? And of course, it's insane, but it's also incredibly inspiring, and that allows them to go yeah. far and faster. And then the third Third thing, which is probably the hardest thing to fix, is the is the tech transfer policies at universities. So basically, if you develop cool technology at a university, you typically have to negotiate with your university to get that IP out and into a company. Mm -hmm. And in the top research universities in the United States, that process is kind of a pain in the butt, but you can get it done in, in, in months and the deal you get will be pretty reasonable. In the vast majority, vast majority of European research universities, that process takes minimum like six months, up to two years. Imagine trying to wait two years to start your company. And oftentimes the university takes so much economic right in the company that the company then can't even go out and raise from venture capitalists because it has a broken cap table. And if there was one thing I would fix about the European tech ecosystem, it would be making the university tech transfer process look a little bit more like it does at American universities. Mm -hmm. Here, Great here. points all around. Definitely agree with that IP licensing issue. Also, uh, so Voyager, we invest about a third in Europe, about two thirds in the US. We also see that wild-eyed ambition, that really intense Silicon Valley style global ambition more frequently in 
North America, particularly the US. Would love to see more of that in Europe. Uh, point in Europe's favor, you get a lot of smaller markets creating more proving grounds and conditions mm. in those local markets might sometimes be ahead of where they are in the US. So you know, the penetration of electric vehicles in certain countries well in advance of the US market allowed entrepreneurs to start building for those markets sooner. Mm. So that's uh, it's very exciting as early stage investors to kind of see how these things play out sooner in some places than others. Let's talk about hard tech versus software. Uh, I was speaking to an investor yesterday who said, I love investing in software. It's got the, you know, the best business model, the best margins, and my distribution's free. I'm not going to go anywhere near anything that's you know, moving atoms around in the physical world and kind of implied that everyone who does is a sucker. And I, I think that's like a myth that software is always inherently going to be like a better business, better business model than hardware. Um, I would imagine some of you agree there. For example, your distribution's not free. If you sell on the App Store, I think they take like 30%, maybe 40%. It's I think north of 50% on some other platforms, maybe YouTube. Folks in the audience probably know this better than me. Um, and you may have to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to acquire enough customers to really go public or otherwise become a really big company. If you're a hard tech company and you have a manufacturing facility and one customer is going to sign the offtake for all of your electric planes you're making or all of the you know, metal that you're producing, great. You don't have to spend anything on marketing or customer acquisition. So I, I, I would really push back on that notion that yeah, only you, know, you in, can't only build a great business in hardware. And so, yeah. Uh, only in hard tech have I seen like, you know, advanced purchase orders of a billion dollars plus for a startup that you know, has no revenue. <laughs> uh, and yeah, you know, it's possible. Yeah, I agree. And, and I was like um, reading this very good um, blog by things Blossom Street Ventures, who um, analyzed 73 SaaS IPOs and, um, and sort of defined uh, the amount that they raised pre-IPO. And the average was 600 plus million. The median was 300, so to be fair. <laughs> a bit less, but it's still a lot of money. So even if in theory you could do it with much less, and we all have this fantasy of WhatsApp stories, etc. Reality just tells something different. Where I think, and I, I agree with you so much, um, there's this kind of intellectual uh, laziness, I would say, to sort of shortcuts. Truth is that just the growth looks different. You now you, if, especially if we talk about hard tech and industrial tech, which is even a step further. Uh, it's more like this, you know, like you grow, you have your facility, it's a pilot, and then you wait, and then you have a big purchase order, and then you went. So it, it's just a different growth s style and funding, and, but it doesn't mean that it's less efficient, and it doesn't mean that you'll make less money. It just means that it's a different way of doing it. Um, and, and, and I agree with you, we can't just put everything on software. Uber raised 25 billion dollars. <laughs> this is a capital efficient you know, software <laughs> company. $25 billion. And because they don't have the magic formula, which Sarah talked about, which is, oh, I make a thing, and that thing makes me X per month, and therefore my payback period is Y, all that they raise basically has to be equity financing, which of course for investors is not great because you get diluted every time. Uh, whereas a lot of these deep tech companies can raise debt financing or project financing, which is basically a sort of loan that doesn't actually dilute the other shareholders. And so it tends to be actually a much cheaper source of capital. And then I get really riled up when people say like, oh, but you know, software has made so much more than deep tech over the last you know, 10 years or the last 20 years. Um, especially from, you know, it, it, VCs are supposed to be about what's next, not about what was in the past. And you know, if you look at the history of, say, Silicon Valley, uh, it got its name because of semiconductors. And that was kind of the cool thing to invest in, semiconductors. And then guess what? It was networking. And if you, when networking was becoming a thing, were like, oh, I don't know, that you haven't made much money networking, it's all about semiconductors, you would have missed the big trend. And then it became the internet. And if you were like, I don't know about this internet, networking's kind of the cool thing, you would have missed internet, the whole internet trend. And then, and then it was mobile. And if you had this, you could have been, I don't know, there's not a lot of mobile companies, mainly internet companies. You would have, like, you'd miss every big wave ever if you wanted evidence for its success before it happened. Like, you just can't get, that's the nature of new waves, right? And so, uh, I think, when we look at climate in particular, and, and, and just in general global problems, software is kind of easy to build now. A couple of high school students can build a SaaS app over a weekend. It's amazing.
everything. It's a, so, so, so you end up with a hundred products that roughly do the same thing. Yeah, That's you, the you main have a lot of competition, thing. but it also means that like the easy problems to get solved have been solved by software if they could have been solved by software because it's so easy to launch. And the problems that we're left with are really hard problems that require really hard solutions. Yeah. Trust me, if you could have solved the climate crisis with a SaaS app, someone would have done it. <laughs> we, have a lot of, we have a lot of SaaS app developers. It doesn't mean that there's no place for software in the climate crisis, no, no. but a lot of these problems are still around because they require these incredibly hard, deep tech solutions. They often require brilliant PhDs that have been working in a lab for many, many years to bring that technology out to the world to solve the problem. And so don't look at the past. No. Think about what's next. Deep tech, climate, that's it. And we look out and we see these amazing founders. You know, some of them are repeat founders, some are first timers out of the best universities, and they're working on these problems. And there's like no world in which some of them, many of them, are not going to build world changing companies. Mm -hmm. Because that's what amazing founders fucking do. So lightning round, because we're pretty much out of time. So if you can keep it to maybe one sentence, what is a technology or company that gives you hope? Synthetic biology is going to change the world. Oh, there's so many. Um, you go ahead when I pick one. <laughs> um, Actually, I, I, all of the, the things, yes. I'll just shout out to fucking politicians everywhere. <laughs> you know, uh, take some freaking leadership. You know, people want to be asked to do things. They want to be asked for deprivation. Uh, you know, that's meaning of life. This is, you know, one of our good friends, Albert Wenger, was saying this, has been saying this for a while. Like, people want to be asked to sacrifice, you know? So ask people to sacrifice and, you know, fucking invest in this in a way that we're not doing right now. Even the IRA is, like, tiny compared to what we need. Take some fucking leadership. So, uh, not a technology, even though I love technology, one thing for me is the number two issue that people cared about in the midterm elections in the US was climate. And if you poll people, uh, even globally, it's about 70% of people actually care about climate. They want action on climate. We've been told it's not popular. That's a lie. Yeah. Like, it's actually incredibly popular. People want this. Any, any last thoughts, Sophia? Um, yeah, just on, to answer your question, I think we, I'm very excited about the ocean in general. Like, 95% are completely discovered. It's an, for me, it's the next frontier in synthetic bio to discover new molecules and energy production. I'm fascinated by what this door can, can sort of bring us. Wonderful. Well, on that note, thank you all for joining us. Thanks. And uh, we're delighted to be investing in the future. We hope you'll join us. <laughs> Go build some stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.